Hi, I'm Alan Boswell, and welcome to the first episode of our new series, The Horn, brought to you by the International Crisis Group. The Gulf and Turkey are investing heavily in the Horn of Africa. Their influence and money has upended politics in Somalia and Sudan in particular, and often for the worse. Today we're talking with Elizabeth Dickinson, our senior analyst on the Gulf. Elizabeth has spent years interviewing Gulf officials about their interventions in the Horn of Africa. We just launched a report that includes much of her research. She's here today to tell us all about that. Hi, Elizabeth. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. We have a lot to talk about today on this new report that has just come out. So first of all, set the scene for us. When we talk about the Red Sea as a new power arena, what area of the world are we really talking about? So it's really both sides of the Red Sea corridor. Um, on the one hand, you have the Horn of Africa, which stretches essentially from northward from Sudan uh, down through Somalia, uh, including Ethiopia and Eritrea, Djibouti, um, and downwards toward the Somalia and Kenyan coasts. And this is um, an, a region of Africa that at, at its closest point is really just about uh, 10 or 15 kilometers from the Arabian Peninsula, which is sort of the other half of the equation here. So there we're talking about the Gulf states, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and Qatar particularly, uh, but also to a lesser extent Oman, Kuwait, and of course Turkey. Why all of a sudden is there a bunch of talk about the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden? Why are we seeing this all of a sudden? Essentially, uh, particularly since the Arab uprisings in the Middle East, uh, there's been a sense in, in among the Gulf states particularly that there's a leadership vacuum uh, in the Middle East. And because so many of the traditional leaders of the Middle East, states like Egypt and Syria and Iraq, uh, were weakened so significantly in 2011, 2012, that there was a sense from the Gulf states that they had not only the opportunity to step up and play a leadership role, but in fact, the obligation, and they felt that they were the only ones who could push the Middle East in a different direction. So coupled with that, however, you had sort of a grinding frustration that although the Gulf states felt that they should be the leaders in the Middle East, all of the conflicts in the Middle East were sort of stuck. So they weren't making a lot of headway in Syria. They had lost influence to Iran in a number of places throughout the region. So there was this this sense that they needed to sort of compete and demonstrate their leadership, but a lack of geography in which to do so. And this is when you saw them begin to look for sort of new spaces and and really turn to the Red Sea and the Horn of Africa as a place where they could rebalance the equation in their favor. Um, added on top of this that is, is the fact that the Gulf states are not united amongst themselves by any means. So in addition to the Gulf states feeling that they had this leadership role, they wanted to cut out their rivals from having a similar position that was prominent in sort of setting the, the direction of the region. Um, and, and I'd say that the sort of final piece of that really is the enormous economic potential that the Horn of Africa offers to the Gulf states. And, and tied with this is the growing role of China in the Horn of Africa and, and the goal of all the Gulf states to improve their relationships with China and seeing the Horn of Africa as a place where they could do that through economic cooperation. Now, of course, previously, the U.S. probably would have been seen as the most important um, outside power player in the Horn of Africa. Um, in some ways, the, the Gulf's incursion then is, is an implicit rejection of sorts of U.S. leadership here. From your conversations, how do the Gulf leaders talk about U.S. power and policy in this region? To be honest, they were quite dismissive, um, saying that the U.S. is barely involved in this region. They really can't um, make an impact or really aren't even interested to a large extent. Uh, I think that perhaps that, that might have evolved a little bit because we did see that the U.S. was quite involved very recently on Sudan. But generally, I think the Gulf states see it as their... Um, their prerogative to be involved in the Horn of Africa, whereas the U.S. and Europe are so much further away and, and so much less viscerally affected by the security concerns that they feel just across the water that I think they really feel like they have the right to be there in a way that the U.S. and, and, and Europe and sort of these traditional powers don't. So let's go through these these four countries which are really highlighted in the report, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, uh, Qatar and Turkey and go through them one by one. From your conversations with them, what do they see as their strategic objectives out here and what are they really going for? So first, let's talk about the Saudis. So all of the Gulf states and Turkey, without exception, say that their primary goal in the, in the Horn of Africa is stability. Um, but how they define that is is diametrically opposed. So the UAE and Saudi Arabia tend to prefer sort of 
I would say almost short-term stability. They like to sort of control political dissent and use economic growth to really address the grievances that they see as driving political instabilities. Um, Qatar and Turkey's view, I think, is quite different in the sense that they have tended to see uh, popular mobilization as an opportunity, uh, both to address sort of long-standing grievances in some cases, but also more pointedly, I think, to empower some of their allies in the region, particularly among Islamist groups linked to the Muslim Brotherhood. With that sort of setting the stage, if we talk about the Saudis, why have they re-engaged in Africa and, and how are they doing it? So Saudi Arabia's contemporary role in the Horn of Africa really began with its spreading of Salafist uh, Sunni Islam in the Horn of Africa. And this was part of a Cold War policy um, that was linked to U.S. policy that sort of used this ideological component in addition to ample uh, sort of cash and aid to combat socialism and, and sort of Soviet influence. So fast forward to today, there's, there's still this sort of underlying of Saudi influence that really does have this tint of that religious ideology and that colors, I think, a lot of their engagement today, even though their strategies and tactics today, I think, have shifted somewhat significantly from that. But again, in popular opinion, it sort of clouds everyone's opinion and, and view of, of Saudi engagement. I think today the primary motivation for the Saudis to be in the Horn of Africa is, is to counter their primary rival in the broader region, which is Iran. Just a few years ago, Iran had a relatively significant presence in the Horn of Africa. They sometimes accessed uh, a military base in Eritrea, the base of Assab. Um, they worked quite closely with the former government in Sudan, Bashir. Um, so, uh, you know, the Saudis, as they've tried to counter Iran in the Middle East, they've also seen Africa as, as a place where they can push back. And frankly, the only theater where they've had any success in pushing back Iran. I think Saudi Arabia cites great successes in convincing Eritrea and Sudan, as well as Somalia, actually, to break ties with Iran all since 2015. Um, how did they do that? It's, it's honestly a, a primarily based on sort of a cash aid and sort of political support. It's really sort of a transactional sort of assistance. But there's also something very particular about seeing Africa at the center of, of the for, sort of foreign policy apparatus in a way that it really hasn't been in the past. Now, how have we seen uh, MBS and the Saudis really use these tools in the Horn of Africa? Can you give some specific examples? Sure. So I think the, the example that um, is sort of closest to the Saudis' um, heart is, is really Sudan. Um, Saudi Arabia uh, offered assistance to Sudan as well as help in lifting international sanctions against the country and managed to convince uh, Omar al-Bashir, the president at the time, to not only uh, break ties with Iran but to send troops to the coalition, the Saudi-led coalition in Yemen where they remain today. So this was really a, a major sort of regional coup in terms of shifting the political balance because Sudan had long had ties to Iran and, and really resisted breaking them off. More recently, we've seen um, Saudi support in, in one of the sort of positive examples of what Gulf engagement can do um, in helping to usher along the peace agreement between Ethiopia and Eritrea. Uh, Saudi Arabia, together with the UAE, I, I think facilitated is maybe too strong of a word, but sort of helped push along the peace agreement between the two countries and and particularly helped to finance sort of incentives for the agreement and give sort of a um, almost a, a safety net for the for both countries to move forward. Now, we'll talk more about uh, those specific examples, Sudan and Ethiopia, uh, more later. Uh, now, on the Emiratis, uh, we'll talk about them next. Now, they're, of course, allied quite strongly with Saudi Arabia, uh, but it would be wrong to place them in identical buckets, uh, as is sometimes done with Saudi Arabia, and as we've seen recently in Yemen, would be a mistake to do. So, so how does their approach to the Horn of Africa really differ um, from the Saudis and, and the tools by which they, they, they approach these issues? I think that's really a key point because they, they, there's sort of a tactical alignment, again, with Saudi Arabia, but I think in terms of their key objectives in the Horn, they really are different. And although they, they sort of share, um, at times their allies on the ground are similar, at times they're also uh, very different in their objectives. So um, the UAE, really, I like to think of the UAE in the Horn of Africa as having sort of two tracks of engagement. Um, the older one and sort of the, the, the one that set the stage was the commercial track. So the UAE, I think, before 
uh, any of the other Gulf states really saw the Horn of Africa as an economic opportunity. In 2006, they signed an agreement with Djibouti to develop its port um, into what is today uh, the only deep water container port in the Horn of Africa. Um, the second track, though, is the sort of strategic and security track. And the strategic track is really uh, very much about combating um, sort of perceived uh, enemies and most pointedly political Islamists and the Muslim Brotherhood, as well as their benefactors. So that primarily means uh, Qatar and to a lesser extent Turkey. It, it really in many ways is about a worldview. Uh, the UAE views political Islam as a fundamentally dangerous idea that is sort of a gateway drug to extremism of all sorts, whether it's Al-Qaeda or ISIS or Al-Shabaab. Um, and so I think there are the way that they engage with the region is very much through that lens of trying to push back any signs that they see that political Islamists would be gaining influence. Um, the UAE is also quite unique among the Gulf states in its ability to use hard power as well as soft power on the continent. Um, so the UAE has basing agreements in Asab in Eritrea, as well as in Berbera in Somaliland and Basasa in Puntland. Um, it's also offered security training to local allies, which is something that um, few other Gulf states have the ability to do at the same level um, that the UAE does. And in addition to that, they are very like hands-on in their engagement with leaders in the Horn of Africa. So one of the things that the UAE has been quite, quite adept at doing is seeing moments of transition and sort of piloting in right at the key moments and, and making key relationships. We saw this most particularly in Ethiopia when, as the new prime minister took office in April two th 2018, um, the crown prince of Abu Dhabi, uh, Mohammed bin Zayed, flew to Addis Ababa at the last day of Eid and, and sort of saw him in person, sort of made a big splash and established a core personal relationship with the leader of Ethiopia that has been really the basis of their engagement going forward. When the UAE expanded its foreign policy so significantly, of course they made new friends, they also made new enemies, and I think that's something that has surprised them. Yeah, we, we've seen that blowback quite distinctly in Sudan, where the Saudis and Emiratis uh, drew the very strong ire of the protesters uh, for backing the military junta. And it seems like they're still kind of reeling back from that in a way. So so one thing that I think would be helpful, uh, you know, to our listeners and, <laughs> and to me is to help understand how do you go about trying to often figure out uh, who's really acting in a particular situation? The way that I like to think about this is that um, I think what Saudi Arabia and the UAE share is this idea that um, stability, and by that I mean a lack of political unrest, is the vital component to having a prosperous region. Um, I think where they differ in the details is really about sort of a prioritization of enemies. Again, uh, the Saudis would prioritize sort of Iranian influence. The Emiratis would prioritize political Islamists and Qatari influence. And so, you know, carving out and, and keeping those rivals away from key strategic countries in the Horn of Africa, uh, each of them are going to focus in a different way to do that. Now then, moving to the other side, uh, if you will, on the uh, Gulf divide at the moment, uh, how do we see the Qataris really uh, spending uh, their political capital in the Horn of Africa, are they on their back foot right now after Sudan? Or would that be um, unfair to really say at this point? I think Qatar's engagement with the Horn of Africa was pretty piecemeal until 2017, uh, when the Gulf crisis erupted. And all of a sudden, they had to scramble to sort of geopolitically realign. Uh, they had to do that for strategic reasons, but they also had to do it just to survive. Um, so I think this really sort of opened up their imagination in a new way to the Horn of Africa, and you've seen them engage with the continent in a, really in a new way. Um, now you do see that they view the Horn of Africa as really a place where they can um, increase their strategic depth, uh, evade the blockade that's around them, and where possible, exact revenge and take out a cost on the other Gulf states that are also trying to have influence in the Horn of Africa. So I think they're very interested in, in sort of um, payback to some extent against the Saudis and the Emiratis um, in the Horn. And we've seen that very clearly. Now, what's, of course, really ironic uh, in some respects is that both sides, or at least especially the Saudis and Emiratis, are really saying that they are promoting stability. And of course, the the grand synthesis of uh, 
the competition between these two sides in the Gulf has been a destabilization in many of the countries in the Horn of Africa. Again, the Gulf states always say that one of the reasons that they are involved in the Horn of Africa is because they understand that instability could easily spread from the Horn of Africa into the Arabian Peninsula. So in other words, you know, what happens in the Horn doesn't stay in the Horn. It can come affect us as well. Well, right now, actually, the opposite is happening. What's happening in the Gulf countries between themselves is actually spreading into the Horn and increasing instability. So the, the, they have the right understanding of conflict dynamics, but the directionality, I think, is reversed. So it's actually the Gulf in many ways that's contributing to instability rather than the other way around. Now, let's talk quickly about the Turks, uh, who I think in many respects would be happy not even to be included um, in this discussion, perhaps um, at least lumped with the Gulf actors. How have how do the Turks really play into this this power arena that we've sketched out? Um, the, the way I generally like to describe uh, Turkey's role in the horn um, again, with this sort of uh, combination of factors, is really a sort of a virtuous cycle. So there was political interest in expanding in the region, so they set up more embassies. And then that facilitated more business ties. And then the business ties sort of demanded a security investment in order to protect what was being built. Turkey now is really in sort of damage control mode to an extent, trying to guard those investments and that goodwill that they really have sort of genuinely earned, I think, in many parts of the Horn of Africa from being tainted by these political disputes uh, in the Gulf. Can you just describe how the Gulf powers especially, um, but also the Turks, because they're heavily invested in there, how they view at the moment their current role in Somalia? And do they recognize when others criticize them for having, you know, made a fragile country even even more fragile? So the Somalia incident, uh, I think, that really crystallized the competition between uh, most pointedly the Qataris and the Emiratis. It really blew up in 2018. Some cash was seized from a UAE plane that had arrived. The Emiratis said it was for a military training program. The government in Mogadishu said it was to pay off, you know, politicians and whatnot. Um, the at the government in Mogadishu at the time was very heavily allied with with Qatar, so there was sort of this taint and this sense that this was really the countries and the Emiratis going at each other's throats. Um, I think what's interesting to me is that when we discuss this conflict with Emirati policymakers on the one hand and countries on the other, they actually described it as a direct competition and a direct confrontation between their rivals. So, you know, the Emiratis said, wow, you know, the Qatar is really, um, they're really doing well in Mogadishu, but let's see what happens. The Qatar is saying, you know, the UAE, they should stay out of Mogadishu because they're not welcome there. So it, it was really quite uh, above board, let's say, about just how openly these two sides were competing in this extremely fragile country. Um, I think this, the situation today is uh, certainly, uh, although it may be seem quieter, it certainly isn't improved. Essentially, you have a government in Mogadishu that is allied with Qatar and also uh, Turkey. Um, and you have a periphery, so the federal member states of Somalia, which have always had a sort of separatist or um, autonomous tendency, let's say, um, more closely allied with the UAE. So you have a periphery and a center that are fundamentally disconnected, first because of their own uh, local politics, but then the added layer is these external players who have really solidified splits that already existed within the society. Um, I think the UAE, for its part, uh, they've told us very clearly that they have no interest in working with the central government in Mogadishu as long as the Qataris have such strong influence there. Um, the Qataris, for their part, I think, um, you know, have no interest probably in, um, you know, letting the UAE play any role in, in Somalia. Uh, and so we'll continue to try to push all of their interests out. It really is sort of a zero-sum situation. And so while I think they do understand the that, it is a fragile context that doesn't necessarily change their behavior. Now, if Somalia is on, on one side of this equation, as I think a, a place where the the negative effects of this competition is, is has been uh, really obvious, in some ways, Ethiopia, at least at the moment, looks like it might be a more positive flip side of this. And it's also interesting, I think, in just in terms of the sequence of events, uh, because after Abi took power, um, he first turned to the U.S. actually for money um, because he w inherited a, a massive debt crisis. Um, and it was only after being disappointed basically in the inability for the U.S. to 
to quickly and significantly, you know, assist him, that he then really turned towards the Gulf. Do you think this is an example that other leaders in the Horn can follow? Um, is is Abi's way of both courting the Saudis and Emiratis in a way that's beneficial for his country, but then also not getting dragged into the bigger fight? Is that something that you think other countries are in the position to do much better? So I, I think this raises two really important points. Um, I think the first one is that uh, Gulf influence in the Horn is a reality. The West is not in a position to deliver some of the capital and investment that the Horn of Africa needs. And the Gulf are really the only countries that can do that with the speed, the agility, and um, with the depth that is necessary. I think the second important point that this raises, though, is, you know, this isn't all bad. Ethiopia found that it had an interest, and this interest was in resolving the conflict in Eritrea, uh, both for domestic political reasons in Ethiopia, as well as sort of economic reasons. And they found a partner that could help them do that in a way that was going to serve Ethiopia's interests as much as it would the Gulf states. Um, that's not going to be possible in every situation, and it's very, very challenging. And 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 Prime Minister Abbey has done, uh, I mean, he, he sort of walks a very delicate balance. Um, but I do think that it's an example of, of how to look at Gulf engagement as something that can be turned constructively. Now, I want to turn lastly to Sudan. And this is, this is a country uh, which both of us have spent a significant amount of time this year uh, working on and researching and, and trying to get uh, to the bottom of and stay on top of what's been a, a really remarkable uh, chain of events um, for the Sudanese people. And this is an example where the Gulf came in and played a really decisive role in the events. I would love to hear the tale of Sudan from across the Red Sea, uh, how your interlocutors are discussing it and how they really viewed the events this past year. Well, this was really sort of a, a, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, I think, as the Gulf states saw it. Um, Sudan is a really important country for the Gulf because it sits on the periphery of lots of other important issues for the Gulf. So it's sort of, a, it's sort of like the keystone in an amalgam of um, conflicts in the region, whether that's Libya, whether it's Chad, um, Egypt, of course, which is very core to the Gulf's sort of sense of, of, of security, um, Ethiopia right next door, uh, still undergoing a very fragile transition. President Bashir was, in the eyes of the Saudis and the Emiratis, a, an extremely capricious ally. He was never decisively in any camp. He played the two sides off of each other, and this was in infinitely frustrating to the Gulf. So when it became clear that his regime was very fragile, uh, I think it's fair to say that the Saudis and the Emiratis were eager to take the opportunity to empower um, their allies in the military, who they felt could more effectively deliver on their interests. Now, I think their expectations of how that was going to play out were um, they, they expected it to be far easier than it was. Yeah, I mean, j just to be clear, they swept in very much in support of the military junta that took power. Um, so whereas, of course, they might have seen it as countering uh, the Qataris from the Sudanese perspective. Of course, this looked like them backing the old regime versus the protesters themselves. Exactly. And I think there was very much a sense in Gulf capitals. I mean, the way that it was described to me by Saudi and Emirati officials was really that the whole state apparatus would just remain in place. Everything would stay the same. And then you just sort of swipe left and replace one leader with another. Um, and he stays sort of get a new face, but then all of the structure and institutions remain the same. Um, and this idea was to sort of minimize really the transformation that happened in Sudan and, and also to minimize the, the sort of impact of change and any potential chaos that could be injected into the transition that they saw as having the ability to empower um, their rivals, particularly the political Islamists who had uh, been a part of Bashir's party, but then by the, um, by the time of his fall were primarily in the opposition. Um, I think, unfortunately, as, as you know well, uh, this had exactly the opposite consequence. Um, because they backed the military so strongly and decisively, it injected a level of violence and insecurity, um, as well as, as sort of just the, the real risk of all-out conflict in Sudan in a way that perhaps wouldn't have happened had they not come in so decisively in, um, in favor of the military. Um, we understand, for example, from speaking with um, 
officials from the African Union, the negotiations between the protesters and uh, the military were going far better before the Gulf uh, became so involved to support the military and gave the military really sort of a, a cushion, a fallback, that they felt safe de sort of delaying compromise or um, not giving up on core interests that perhaps they would have had to sacrifice had it not been for their powerful external allies. Now, what changed after the June 3rd breakup of the sit-in what, what, the the Gulf position it went from you know very much just supporting the the military generals to hang on to power to then pressuring them to actually sign what eventually came to be the power sharing deal and of course we understand that there was a lot of there was a lot of backdoor engagement um, largely from the U.S. and U.K. that really that really um, helped create that that space for a deal but what but that first required the the Saudis and Emiratis to, to really kind of shift tact, if you will, and and uh, push for a power sharing government. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I think the, the key point is that that incident did push the Gulf to shift, shift tactics, but it did not fundamentally change their strategy. You had this perception, I think, in Khartoum that um, Saudi Arabia was sort of that had, had sort of driven some of this behavior, if not implicit, if not explicitly by giving sort of consent to such a move, then implicitly by sort of standing so strongly behind the military. Um, the Saudis sort of had the opposite feeling. They were like, we can't control these guys. Um, they're out of this is going off the rails. And I think that that's what um, that's one of the things that sort of incentivized them to then work with the U.S. and the U.K., to really find a sort of um, off-ramp to this, because I, I do think that there was a realization in those days that this could head in a very negative direction. Um, my favorite sort of quote that we heard from a, a Saudi policymaker at the time was, we want a strong military, not stupid actions. Again, though, you know, that was a shift of tactic. So at the end of the day, did Saudi Arabia or the UAE change who their core allies are in Sudan? No, they are still very closely aligned with the military and the same particular parts of the military that are associated with that massacre. So while they sort of shifted in order to, I guess, um, uh, de-escalate the immediate situation, they didn't have any sort of shift in their long-term behavior. And I think it's very much uh, sort of something to watch about where this transitional government agreement goes and to what extent the civilian authorities that have been empowered are able to sort of claw back some of their authority from the military that remains very strongly supported externally. So, so that's actually a really good segue to the final part of this, uh, which is, of course, how we conclude all of our crisis group reports also, which is, which is recommendations. Now, I, I'd say our recommendations fall mostly into two buckets. Uh, and the first one, of course, is that it's important to try to think of how the Horn of Africa as a region um, and as particular countries within that region can really seek to rebalance its relations versus the Gulf. Now, one of the things that has been proposed is a Red Sea Forum, which we agree is a good idea. It is also complicated. Uh, can you explain why? Yeah, so I think um, one, of the, one of the challenges of this issue is that it's very big. So the Red Sea Forum, I think, is, is sort of a first step at just getting some information on the table, sort of bringing conversations above board, making sure that um, alliances are transparent, um, and, and really creating a platform where um, both sides of the Red Sea can share concerns, share information, and bring some, I guess, new visibility to their engagement. You know, who's doing what deals, what are the terms, um, move away from the tendency at the moment, which is bilateral relationships, to multilateral relationships, um, because this, I think, is something that could improve the Horn's bargain bargaining power is simply to show up in numbers. Now, the, the second main suggestion, I would say, is looking outside the Horn of Africa region to looking at how other actors and other power players might try to sway the Gulf against pursuing policies that, uh, you know, we and others would consider destabilizing. Where do you think is the lowest hanging fruit on that? I would say Western allies at the moment haven't figured out how to talk to the Gulf about the Horn of Africa. I, th I think that the Gulf is interested in playing a constructive role. Um, I think they're sort of feeling their way out um, to do that. And there are these destructive tendencies, and particularly 
the competition between one another. Um, but I think talking to the Gulf about the Horn of Africa in a new way and, and sort of thinking about what are their core interests and realizing, frankly, the stakes for the Gulf. This is just across the waterway. This is not some faraway place for them. And so I guess my, my thinking is how do we find a way to engage these actors that's going to be constructive to build shared interests, um, you know, for that, for the long haul. And on the flip side of it, even as many Western governments, you know, will criticize the Gulf for its actions, uh, oftentimes they then look to these same Gulf actors as a sort of ATM machine um, in, the, in the current Sudan context because of U.S. sanctions. We then also sort of uh, need their money to stabilize Sudan. Well, that's exactly right. And I mean, that's the point I think that the Gulf states would raise is if we're paying for this, why shouldn't our interests be included in the equation? Um, I think this is going to be a very important issue going forward on Sudan. And and frankly, I think it's it's something that needs to be thought about uh, by U.S. policymakers in particular who have been reluctant to lift the special sort of state terrorism designation that prohibits aid. Um, The longer that designation's in place, the longer we have, the longer period we have in which the Gulf states are the only ones who can provide assistance to Sudan. And when they're doing, when they're providing the assistance, they will set the terms. Yeah, we think it's absolutely critical for the U.S. to very quickly lift the uh, state sponsor of terror designation, which has placed these sanctions on Sudan. One last question. If you were advising Horn leaders who are genuinely concerned about the corrosive effects that some of these uh, uh, Gulf actors are having um, in their region and in their countries, um, how would you advise them to speak to the Gulf directly? What, what message do you think would be most effective that might start to change their perspective or change their behavior? I guess I would say go to the Gulf with ideas. Um, and, and make them on your terms. Uh, and, and also, frankly, I think it is important to the extent possible to show neutrality. Um, and so, of course, we encourage the Gulf states to show neutrality. We should also encourage the Horn of Africa states to show neutrality. Engage with all sides. There's no reason um, not to do that, not to request investment from, from both sides um, and, and be transparent about that in your engagement with, with all actors. All right. Thanks, Elizabeth. And thanks for coming on our podcast. Thank you so much. Really a pleasure. Hey, all. Thanks for listening. Remember to subscribe. Once again, I'm Alan Boswell. This episode was produced by Maeve Francis.